It's wonderful to be back again together today uh, to be able to continue our study in the book of Romans. Uh, we're up to chapter 16 right now. And uh, today we're going to look at the first 14 verses of this chapter. But before we do, before we read this passage uh, and get into the study, let's just open in a word of prayer and let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that we can once again come to your word. Lord, your word is holy and your word is inspired. And your word, Father, is what you have given to us so that we might be wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the wisdom, for the light, for the understanding that your word gives us. Thank you for the work that it has in our hearts and lives. Thank you, Father, that it is breathed and inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Father, thank you that it is the Holy Spirit today that we ask to help us understand what has been penned by the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of your Spirit. So Father, we ask today, may this passage that we read and the study that we do, may it truly have an impactful, life-changing effect on us, on each and every one of us, Lord, as we listen and as we study the Word of God that you have given to us. So, Father, we ask this today. I commit myself to you as I teach, and I also commit every person that will be listening to what is going to be said. I commit us all to you in the mighty name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's get straight into the study and let's just read our text for today, uh, which is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 14. This is what we read written there. And this is the words of the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been justified from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. This is the word of God that we're going to study today. There are several sections in the book of Romans. The, as Paul wrote this letter, there are sections that he wrote, uh, parts of the letter that he devoted to certain subjects, to certain matters that he wanted to address. We've already in our study previously, uh, in the previous episodes that we've been going through, have, we've already looked at three of the sections that this letter constitutes of. And in this passage, Paul begins a fourth section of the letter. And this section begins here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 and extends right through into chapter 8. In this section that we're just beginning to get into in today's study, Paul is going to address misconceptions about the grace of God and also about the law. 
And uh, he's going to show us and teach us what our attitude as believers in Christ should be towards sin and also towards the law. And as he does so, he's going to give us a deeper insight into what salvation is all about. Uh, What happens to us when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we turn to God in repentance, or as we could say in other words, when we are converted? What happens to us at the point of conversion? In the previous section that we looked at, uh, which goes from Romans chapter 3 verse 21 through to chapter 5 verse 21, Paul was really focused on addressing a heresy uh, that was in the church during his time and still is prevalent even today in the world, a heresy that we call legalism. And so in that section, Paul was addressing uh, 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 the fact that we are not saved by works. We're not saved by trying to keep the law. We're not saved through uh, the ordinances of the law or the sacraments of the law, but that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And so that's what he really focused on in the last section in which we were looking at uh, previously. In this section that we're about to study and will be studying over the next few weeks, Paul is going to address another heresy that was prevalent in the church even in his time and that he knew would be something that the church would have to deal with even going into the future. And it's something that even we as the church today have to deal with. And this is a heresy that basically uh, makes grace or the grace of God out to be a license for sin or a reason for sin or an excuse for us to sin. And so we'll see in this section as Paul addresses this particular heresy, one that really arises because of his teaching about justification by faith. We will see Paul ask and answer four questions. Okay, so we're not going to be looking at all those questions today. These are four questions that arise in this particular section of the letter of Romans. Uh, The four questions are number one, the one that we're going to look at today, Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? We see this one uh, asked right here in our passage in this text that we read in verse 1. The second question that Paul will ask in this particular section of his letter is found in Romans chapter 6 and verse 15 where uh, he asks, Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? And then the third question which he's going to ask in this section is found in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7 where Paul says, is the law sin? And then lastly, the fourth question he will ask in this particular section of the letter is found in Romans chapter 7 and verse 13 where he asks this question, did the law become a cause of death for me? So each of these four questions as Paul asks them and as he answers them, are going to address the heretical ideas that had arisen because of Paul's teaching on justification by faith and his teaching on grace, that that which we were looking at in the previous section of this letter. And as I said before, these ideas were widespread even in Paul's time and continue to be widespread even in the church today. In fact, they're becoming more and more prevalent in the church today than they have been in the past. And so in answering these questions, Paul is really going to give us a a godly, correct and proper uh, attitude and perspective on the grace of God, on sin, on what uh, salvation is all about and also what the law is to us, what our perspective and attitude to the law should be. And he's really going to uh, deal with the heresy that people ungodly people who we call antinomians um, were perpetrating in his time and still perpetrate to this day. So let's have a look at the first question, the one that we're going to discuss today and study today, and uh, we're going to see Paul answer today. This question, as I said, is found in verse 1, and this is what it says. Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? Why does Paul even ask this question? Well, he asks this question because of what he had just said at the end of chapter 5, at the very end of the previous section that we studied last week. I just want to read these two verses to you at the very end of that chapter. 
because it will give us context of why Paul is asking this question. So this is Romans chapter 5, verse 20 to 21. And this is what we read there. Paul said, Now the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you see where he says here, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And Paul, having penned those words, realized that there were going to be people that would take that statement there and turn it into a heresy uh, that would lead people away from the truth. And so having made that statement where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, he now asks this question, are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? What is Paul's answer to this question? Well, at the very beginning of verse 2, we see his answer. And it is an emphatic, may it never be. In the Greek, Paul uses the, the strongest possible language. He, he uses language which we today could translate as absolutely not with an exclamation mark. Or we could say, not in a thousand years. That's the kind of emphasis Paul puts on his answer here. May it never be. You see, Paul obviously wanted to make absolutely sure that no one in reading uh, the previous section of Scripture that he had penned on justification by faith and on salvation through God's grace alone would ever use that teaching to, as a means of justifying or validating this heresy that we should continue in sin or that we can continue in sin so that grace may increase. Um, you see, people today are, are teaching a form of this heresy. I've heard people say to me, sin is no longer an issue with God. Sin is irrelevant now. Sin is no longer even an issue for us because of grace, because of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's this kind of heresy that Paul is wanting to, to deal with and to make absolutely certain uh, that people would not get the wrong idea of what he was actually teaching in the previous section on justification by faith. However, as we'll see in this section, not only does Paul emphatically answer this question, uh, he also explains why his answer is so emphatic, why he was so strong when he said, may this never be. And so the rest of the passage that we read is really Paul explaining why he, he makes this uh, strong answer to this question. And it has to do with understanding what salvation is and what takes place inside a person when they are saved. You see, there is more to salvation than just justification. There's more to the cross of Jesus Christ than just justification. There's more to God's grace than just justification. In fact, salvation and the cross and God's grace is also about transformation. Salvation is not just God justifying the ungodly and forgiving the disobedient. It is God making the ungodly godly and the disobedient obedient. In other words, it's about transforming our lives. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 5 that the purpose of his ministry and the preaching of the gospel was, and I quote, to bring all the nations to the obedience of faith for the sake of Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, Paul uh, wrote these words, And he, that's Jesus, died for all so that they who live would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. I want you to notice what he says here. He says that Jesus died. Why? So that those who lived would no longer live for themselves, but would live for Christ, for Jesus himself, the one who died for them and rose again. So that there would be a complete change in the way they lived and in the purpose of their lives. Instead of living for themselves, they would be living for Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin 
and live to righteousness. Notice that last uh, part of that verse, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. This explains the purpose of God's grace. This explains the purpose of the cross, of Jesus' death. It explains what God is wanting to achieve in in our lives. And you can see from these uh, statements that it's more than just justification. It involves transformation. And this is exactly what Paul is saying right here in Romans chapter 6. He's not saying anything different to what we've just read in those verses. We must understand that the work of salvation is more than justification. It is also regeneration and sanctification. Salvation is a complete package. It's very important that we understand that. It's not just God declaring us righteous. It is God making us righteous. Last week in our study of Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 21, we saw that justification and eternal life is the result of people being transferred from being in Adam and under Adam's headship to being in Christ and under Christ's headship. And Paul here refers to that transferring, that transferal of someone's life from being under Adam to being under Christ here in Romans chapter 6 as well. He refers to it in verse 3 as being baptized into Christ Jesus. So when we see this phrase here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, where he says you people are baptized into Christ Jesus. He is talking about that transferring of someone from being in and under Adam to being in and under Christ. Let's just read Romans chapter 6 here, verses 2, uh, the second part of verse 2 through to verse 3. This is what Paul said. He said, How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us, notice that, all of us, who were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death. This transferal of a person from Adam to Christ, which Paul here refers to as being baptized into Christ Jesus, which we saw in Romans chapter 5 results in justification and eternal life, is not something that is just theoretical. It is something that changes everything in our lives. And it is something that is symbolized by water baptism in a very profound way. You see, this transferal from being in Adam to being in Christ is a literal spiritual translocation of our lives from the authority of darkness, which means the authority of sin, to the authority of Jesus Christ. It is a literal spiritual deliverance from the dominion and power of darkness. And it is a a moving of someone into a place where they are now under the dominion and authority of Christ. Remember, we saw this in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 last week. Let me just read that verse to you again quickly. Paul said that God, and this is in Colossians 1.13, God rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of His love. That there is what Paul is talking about when he says we were baptized into Christ Jesus. So when he says all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus, all of us who were rescued from the authority of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of His Son, all of us who had that happen to us were also baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. Here in this passage, we see that uh, this transferring from being in Adam to being in Christ involves and necessitates death and resurrection. Death to sin. In verse 2, Paul says we died to sin. Death to our old self. In verse 6, he says our old man was crucified with him. Death to the dominion and control of sin. In verse 7, he says, he who has died has been justified from sin. And that word justified could be translated very uh, properly here to be set free from sin. You see, when we were transferred from being in Adam to being in Christ, we were set free from the control and power of sin, just as a slave uh, 
that has been redeemed is set free from the control and the power of that slave's former master. You see, this transferal is a death to sin, a death to the dominion and power of sin, but it's also a resurrection to a brand new life and a brand new way of life, which Paul refers to in verse 4 of this chapter as newness of life. Let's just read it. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, he says this, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So do you see Paul talking here about death and resurrection? And what he's showing us is in very vivid language, this is what takes place whenever someone is saved. Whenever someone is transferred from Adam to Christ, from death to life, from condemnation to justification, this takes place in their lives simultaneously. Paul is describing in vivid language here what the Lord Jesus called being born again when he was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 3. He's also describing what he meant when he spoke in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 about everyone who is a new creation in Christ Jesus. In fact, we could go as far as to say that unless death and resurrection has taken place in someone's life, in other words, unless someone has been born again or has become a new creature in Christ, that person is not in Christ and is therefore not justified. You see, all that Paul is describing here, all that we're talking about, is actually one complete package of salvation. This goes together with justification. You cannot be justified without becoming a new creature in Christ. You cannot be justified without being born again. Look at what the Lord Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 verse 3. He said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 5, uh, his second letter, chapter 5, verse 17. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away and behold, new things have come. If someone is not a new creature, from what we can see here, they are not in Christ. He said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. If the old has not passed away, in other words, has not died, and a new life has not come into being, the person is not in Christ. Because anyone that is in Christ, their old life has passed away, it has died, it has been put to death, and a new life has come into being. If a person is not in Christ, that means that they are not under his headship. And that means that they have not received justification. It has not been imputed to them because they are not in Christ. They are still under Adam, and that means that they are still under condemnation. You see, what we need to realize is that we cannot have justification without having death and resurrection, without being born again, and without becoming new creations in Christ Jesus. We cannot have one without the other. You see, salvation is not only God doing something for us, in other words, justifying us or declaring us righteous. Salvation is God doing something in us. And Paul in his letters that we have in Scripture often spoke about this. I'm going to give you an example here in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, where Paul said this, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you, do you see that phrase there, a good work in you, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, the work of God in us, in salvation, is to make us new creatures in Christ. It's about all that we've been talking about. 
And only God can do this work in somebody. Only He can do it in you. Only God can baptize us into Christ Jesus. Only God can justify us. Only God can deliver us from the power of darkness. Only God can transfer us into the kingdom of His Son and bring about in our lives a death to sin. Only God can raise us from that death into newness of life. Only God can cause us to be born again. Only God can make us new creations. Salvation is the work of God. This is why Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says this, For we are His workmanship, that's God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. What is God's purpose for making us new creatures in Christ? It's not so that we would continue on living in sin. It's not so that we would continue to live the way that we've always lived. It's not so that we would continue to be like the rest of humanity, bound up in depravity and perversion and uncleanness. That's not what God has created us in Christ Jesus for. His purpose in making us a new creature in Christ, His purpose in giving us new birth, His purpose in baptizing us into Christ Jesus, His purpose in saving us from being under the influence of Adam's sin and bringing us under the influence of Jesus Christ and His obedience is so that we would commit or we would do good works. As Paul says right, right here, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. That is the purpose of God and salvation. It's not just about justification. It's about the transformation of our lives. It's about us becoming people that we were not. And that's what we see in Scripture when we look at the lives of people that were saved back then. People like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, who was the greatest persecutor and opponent of the church, became the greatest builder um, of the church. You see, his life was completely transformed when he came to faith in Jesus Christ. He was not just justified, he was transformed. And that is God's purpose for His grace in our lives. That is God's purpose in sending Jesus Christ, His Son, to the cross to die for our sins. That is the purpose of salvation. And that is the purpose of His work in our lives. As those whom God has saved, this is how we must see ourselves. We must see ourselves as new creatures in Christ as those who have been born again into a brand new life, as those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus. We are now united with Him. We are His people and our identification is with Him. We need to live that way. We need to see ourselves that way. We need to see ourselves as those who have died with Christ to sin. We need to see ourselves as those who have been liberated from sin's power and dominion and control. And we need to see ourselves as those who have been raised up together with Christ to live a new life for His glory. This is why Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 11, right here in this passage that we read, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's how we need to consider ourselves. That's how we need to see ourselves as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus Christ, and as Christians. Does this all mean that we will no longer have any problems with sin. What we've been saying about the new birth and about being new creatures in Christ, about having died to sin, about having been raised up with Christ to live a completely new life, does it mean that we will not have any problems with sin? Not at all. What does it mean? It means this, that there is something we must do in dealing with sin. 
And it's very interesting that from the very beginning of Romans right up to this particular passage, in all the previous chapters that we've read, Paul never once tells us to do anything. In the previous chapters, he's just establishing truth. And he comes to this place now where he suddenly, in verse 11, tells us to do something. He says, consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You see, there is something we need to do in response to God's grace, in response to the truths of the gospel. And this is what Paul is beginning to show us here in this passage. There is something that we have a responsibility before God to do. There is something that we need to choose to do. And also, there is something that Paul tells us here, we have the means through God's grace to do. What is it that we must do? Well, let's just read verse 12 and 13 here. He says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. This is completely the opposite to the people that are saying, let's continue in sin so that grace may increase. He says, no, don't do that. May that never be. Absolutely not. Not in a thousand years should you do that. Rather, this is what you should do. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. Verse 13, he says, Do not go on presenting your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. That's what we used to do in our previous life. That's what we used to do before we came to faith in Christ. That's what we used to do before we were baptized into Christ, before we became new creatures in Christ, before we were born again. And he's saying, don't go on living like you used to live before you were put under the headship of Jesus Christ, before you were transferred into his kingdom. He says this, but as those who are alive from the dead, present your members as instruments of righteousness to God. You see, what is he talking about here? He's talking about a complete transformation of our lives from what we were under Adam to what we are under Christ. You see, as Christians, there is to be nothing in our lives that is the same as what it was before we were saved. Salvation is not just justification. It's not just forgiveness of sins. Salvation is completely, complete transformation. I want you to think of a little caterpillar. A caterpillar crawls along the ground and yet there's a time when that caterpillar goes into a cocoon and when that caterpillar comes out of the cocoon, it doesn't come out of the cocoon as a caterpillar, it comes out as a butterfly. In that cocoon, that caterpillar is completely transformed from being this creature that crawls along the ground to being this creature that flies through the sky. And that is a picture of what salvation is intended to be in each and every one of our lives. It is about transformation. God takes us as sinners and He makes us saints. He takes us who are disobedient and He transforms us into those who are obedient. He takes the ungodly and He transforms them into those that are godly. He takes people that are living like Adam did when he sinned in the garden and he transforms them into people that live like Jesus Christ did when he obeyed and, and went to the cross uh, on, in obedience to God's will and command. What makes it possible for us to live like this? What makes this transformation in our lives possible? Well, Paul tells us at the very end of this passage in verse 14, he says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. It is the working of God's grace in our lives that enables this transformation, that produces this transformation. It is the work of God through Jesus Christ, the work of God through the Holy Spirit, the work of God through the Scriptures, the work of God through His grace that enables us to be able to obey what Paul tells us to do here in this passage. Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. Why not? Because it opposes everything that salvation is about. 
It opposes the very work of God in us and it makes us actually to be enemies of God. No one who continues in sin is truly saved. Salvation is God saving us from our sin and bringing us into a new life of righteousness and obedience in Jesus Christ. And I pray that no one of you listening to me today would be deceived by teachers that would try to say anything contrary to this. God's grace, His work in our lives, which we do not earn, which we cannot earn, which there is nothing that we can give to pay for, is what produces this kind of righteous life in us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this truth today. I thank you, Father, for inspiring the Apostle Paul to write these words down for us. Thank you, Father, that they truly make us wise, wise for salvation, wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I pray for every person that has listened to this message today, that they would truly and definitely understand what has been taught, what I have been saying as I try to explain Paul's writing, Paul's words to them. I pray, Father, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would be great within our hearts, the conviction of your call to us, your call uh, upon our lives, your call for us not to obey sin, but, Father, to live for righteousness. I pray, Father, that you would help each and every one of us to do that very thing. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's been a a real privilege to just be able to share these truths with you. And, And as I prayed, it is my hope, my expectation that the Lord will take these words and that He will really give you an understanding of how God working in our lives through the gospel, through and by His grace, by His Spirit, by His Word, produces completely transformed lives. That is God's call upon us. That is God, what we have been predestined for. God has predestined us to be conformed to the very likeness of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so I just want to commit you to the grace of God. I want to commit you to the Scriptures, to the Word of God, to the Word of His grace, which is able to sanctify you and produce this kind of transformed life in you. May God continue the good work which He has begun in you. May He carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. God bless you. I look forward to being with you sometime in the future as we continue this study in the book of Romans. May you have a wonderful day. God bless.